Hello, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Avneet Guman, and today I'm very, very delighted to be presenting this webinar alongside FF Venture Capital's Sean Frankel and three CEOs of his most innovative portfolio companies. The theme of this webinar today is Thriving in the New Normal, Startups that are Growing Amongst Uncertainty. And um, we will be delving into the technology acceleration that the novel coronavirus has spurred. While this has been a black swan event that has created a really unexpected economic downturn, um, downturn venture, FF Venture Capital, Guten, Mana, and Burrow have really created ways to accelerate their business and innovate despite these circumstances. So Prabhjit Mutaneja, who's Vice President of Fordham's Private Equity and Venture Capital Club, and Tiffany Zianzu, who's also Vice President of Marketing, will be moderating today's event alongside myself. So I would love to introduce John Frankel. Um, he's currently the founding partner of Venture Cap FF Venture Capital. Um, a little bit of background um, of his very impressive background. John Frankel is a technology investor. He's very passionate about working with founders that are building the big businesses of tomorrow. He founded FF Venture Capital in 2008 to work with founders that share his vision, um, which, it, which he, and he has since founded over funded over 100 seed and early stage companies that have in turn created thousands of jobs and impacted the lives of millions. While FF Venture Capital's investments span a number of industries, John is particularly fascinated by applied artificial intelligence, encompassing drones, robotics, financial services technology, and cybersecurity. Over the years, John has served on the boards of dozens of companies as well as the NYU Tendon School of Engineering to help in further fostering the New York City ecosystem. Before um, starting FFVC, John did have a long career at Goldman Sachs in a variety of roles, and that involves technology development, business reengineering, and capital markets. Um, he's had the unique opportunity to work with some of the world's leading investors and has developed a very keen understanding of emerging technologies and portfolio risk return management. Um, some educational background, very impressive. After graduating from the New College, Oxford in 1982 with a master's in mathematics and philosophy, John worked at Arthur Anderson and qualified as a fellow chartered accountant. Today, John enjoys traveling the world and is blessed with five amazing children and six incredible grandchildren. And the next um, impressive individual we're interviewing today is Brian Rainey, who's the CEO of Guten. Brian Rainey serves as the chief, chief executive officer of Guten Inc., a technology company that enables e-commerce businesses to easily access high quality global on-demand manufacturing. The Guten platform allows online merchants and content, ha content houses to create products and manage orders across a multitude of stores and sales channels. So Mr. Rainey has a background in accounting and finance, previously serving as the Chief Financial Officer of BuzzPoints Inc. based in Austin, Texas, a fintech company delivering local rewards for community banks and credit unions. Um, so he, he joined Buzz points following work at Deutsche Bank in New York and venture capital services practice at Deloitte in the Washington DC area. At Deutsche Bank, Mr. Rainey focused on serving clients of the industrial technology and global diversified subsectors in a variety of M&A and capital market situations. Um, Mr. Rainey received his BBA in accounting and finance from James Madison University in Virginia and his MBA from Darden School of Business at UVA and holds a CPA license from the state of Virginia. Bobby Healy, he's the CEO and founder of MANA. Um, he's a tech guy, a programmer, and founded Alent Technologies, which he sold in 2003 to Sita Aero. He then built Car Trawler over 14 years ago, the world's largest mobility marketplace for airlines, and led two successful LBOs for the businesses. For the last three years, he's been building MANA, a drone delivery drone delivery as a service business for the world, which he plans to revolutionize the world of online food and pharmacy delivery, making a three minute low cost delivery service as pervasive as running water in the U in Europe and the, US and the USA. And Charlie Anderson, last but not least, he's a CEO of Burrow. Um, Charlie grew up on a fruit and vegetable and livestock farm. This experience led him to believe that all tedious farm labor should be automated and simultaneously to understand the many challenges that robots face in agriculture. He founded Burrow after gaining experience with Case New Holland, John Deere's largest competitor, where he reported to the head of North America, North American Operating Unit and worked on a special project and worked on special projects across sales, marketing, manufacturing, distribution, and autonomy, M&A. He received a BA from Amherst College and an MBA from Harvard Business School. So thank you guys. These are such impressive individuals. We're really, really excited to have them on.
And I'd love to pass on the questions and the rest of the discussion to Prabhjeet and Tiffany. Well, thank you so much, guys, for being here. It's a great honor uh, talking to you guys. And my first question is actually directed towards John. John, you have been a veteran investor that has seen the economy go down through so many cycles and changes. Late 2019, early 2020, many investors were preparing for an economic recession until obviously the uh, novel coronavirus wrecked havoc on their economy. Frankly, this is a black swan event that none of us could have predicted. While many of us out of, uh, seem out of control for many people, is there anything going on right now that you have seen before? And what are you utilizing from those experiences to help balance and manage your portfolio right now? Well, uh, I want to thank everyone for you know welcoming us into their homes, literally. Um, uh, today, we, we live in a, an amazing time. Um, if coronavirus had hit in 95, before there was broadband, um, we wouldn't have so much information. We wouldn't know about the latest treatments. We wouldn't be able to work from home. Um, our businesses would have a lot of paper ledgers. Um, and I think there'd be a lot more debts. The, what's amazing is this came at a time when not only did we have broadband internet, but all of the applications and the application layers are built on to enable companies to be, to flexibly scale um, solutions. It's not like Zoom only has a certain number of instances they can sell and then they're done. They can scale up pretty amazingly because the infrastructure they sit on is scalable. So we're very fortunate that um, we got hit by this now and not say in 95 or some point in the past. The, the, the second thing to understand is whenever a disaster hits, usually sometime later, it was a blip. It was an awful thing that happened. But when you look at it in the economy, when you look at it in the charts, it's a blip. And the underlying trend continues, whether it's up or down or the like. And what we had here was a bull market interrupted and a strong economy interrupted. And so there's a lot of called animal spirits, energy or whatever in the economy and in the market that creates a certain buoyancy. And so, you know, what I think we're seeing is a fascinating recovery. I think most people believe that, you know, from when COVID hit to three years later, we would be here. We'll be as strong or stronger. The number of miles flown on planes will be higher, number of hotels, restaurants and the like that will recover with time. And I'll say three years is a random amount of time. How do we get there? Is it like, is it a U, is it a B, is it a Nike check mark? We don't know. But I think one of the perspectives you get, having been through a lot of downturns, is that a downturn is followed by an upturn. And given that this was a growing economy interrupted, and a bull market interrupted, some part of the recovery will be kind of V-shaped. I don't think it'll all be, but I think there'll be certain amounts of V-shapedness to this. Um, I think for a lot of people, once government says you can go to restaurants, they're gonna go to restaurants. Once government says it's safe to do this, they're gonna do it. Other people will make their own independent decisions, but I think a lot of people follow the guidance that they get from governments. And I think as they go back to restaurants, the restaurants hire people. And those jobs come back. And that starts to create a very positive cycle. Now that's my perspective today in mid-June. I, I will tell you, you know, conversations that we had as the economy was closing down in March, early March, were ones of we're going into a downturn. We don't know how far down it's going to be. We don't know what it's like. And for a lot of our companies, 
the immediate reaction, which I think was the right reaction, was retrenchment. A lot of companies let people go, a lot of companies let their cost base and trimmed it. Then they sort of stood back and watched. And then they, after a couple of weeks after that, as we start to get into April, it was really, okay, how do we now grow the business from here? And I think we're very fortunate to have three very different companies talk about their experiences. Uh, we've invested in all of them. Uh, you know, Bobby will talk about Manor, which is last mile drone delivery and how he sort of pivoted that. Um, Charlie will talk about Borrow, which is um, farm equipment, autonomous uh, donkey or Borrow, uh, as it were, that helps with grape picking and other farm chores. And um, Brian will talk from Guten, which is an e-commerce fulfillment company whose business has accelerated as people have moved into e-commerce. Uh, and though we might have thought it would, you know, less commerce, more e-commerce, I think we've all been surprised about how big amount of growth has, has come over the last couple of months. Uh, so, our, you know, I think the biggest experience was we're going to get through this. It's going to be some shape of down and then some shape of up. And, you know, based on that, we have to prepare for the down. Um, and now I think with much more knowledge about this disease and how to treat it um, and um, speed on uh, work on the government side uh, and hospital capacity, I think there's a sense now that the direction is predominantly up from here. Will there be secondary and tertiary impacts on the economy? You know, we're seeing riots, we're seeing awful disruption, um, we're seeing um, a whole number of issues surface at a societal level. Absolutely. But I think from an economy perspective and a business perspective, um, we're gonna see things start to come up. Nimble startups, uh, first, and I think large enterprises, my sense is Q4, is their get to that work quarter. And I think we'll see uh, robust growth in Q4, and then we'll see it from there. So, so that, that's a sort of overview perspective. I hope that helps. Yeah, yeah it helps. And uh, so Again, um, yeah, I'm very in fond of the attitude that you are feeling very optimistic towards COVID. And I guess a lot of our CEOs here have the accelerating, accelerating moment during the, the past three months. So let's um, open up to all the CEOs, Bobby, Brian, and Charlie. Could you talk to a little bit about what you have been experiencing during this situation, no matter it's good or bad, just uh, let the audience understand more. Then we go down a little bit deeper in that. So who wants uh, Bobby, I'll, Bobby, I'll start. Bobby, don't worry, I'll start. You, you get ready, <laughs> you go up next. Um, yeah. Start with no, the old. Yeah, no, I, uh, yeah, we'll go, what is it? Age before beauty or, um, no, I echo a lot of what John's saying. I, I think it's, it's gonna be interesting. I think one of the nuances from what John has said is the recovery is gonna be much more industry-based this time than I think it has been before. The sort of this this idea of a broad market rebound is going to be very very different. Uh, as John said, we do online commerce fulfillment, and with only fifteen to twenty percent of total of the total U.S. market economy shot or, or, or occurring online, you can imagine when all offline sales stop, there's only one place for those dollars to go. So even if dollar spend comes down by 50%, there's still more than double the amount of spend that has to shift almost by definition to online. We've seen a huge pickup there. But when you start thinking about the recovery, some things don't have replacements. John mentioned hotel rooms and, and flights. I think while people change their behavior in the short term, those will come back. But what does the future of office space look like at this point? Uh, there's, there's a glut of office space. There's what does uh, movie distribution look like you're going to have a few different people kind of testing the waters there 
and then also, what does the idea of the distributed workplace or distributed office look like? When you were forced overnight to work from home, you start to realize, why don't we do this more often? Uh, so I think there's, there's, there's going to be some really interesting nuances to what that looks like. We had a call yesterday and talked about the idea of whether that's just an acceleration of what's going to happen over the next 10 years. Um, but very quickly from my seat, John brings up a good point. In the middle of March, we didn't know what was coming next. And without the sort of negative connotation, history is written by the winners. I, I, I've been on calls with Bobby through this where we kind of figure out best practices. I've taken best practices from Bobby around how we even work with our team um, and keep culture going. But, you know, a lot of people in previous downturns say fire quick because, you know, you really want to be able to save that capital. And, and you know, kudos to... Um, see it, how to say this non-politically, but if you just talk about the PPP program itself, we, we ended up keeping literally four times the amount of people that we were planning on laying off up front and were able to ride a three or four week wave to see that this ended up being positive for us. So I do, I would make the argument that some of the ability to flood the market with capital and kind of add some assurances has bought us time to get through, especially by an industry standpoint. Um, but now, and, and Bobby, I'll throw it over to you. This just starts to feel now like it's the new normal. We felt for April, like this was yeah. a very strange and displacing thing in May. It was okay. How are we going to make this work? And, and June ticked over God, 16 days ago. And now it's just, this is what weeks are. Yeah. Yeah. And, and thanks. Uh, Brian, for figuring out the alphabetical ordering as well for me. Appreciate that. Uh, we have a different alphabet here in Ireland, so that worked out well. Um, so for, for me, uh, a number of things around the pandemic and the new, the new, new. Um, primarily, the first thing that changed for us was, look, we, we readjust, obviously, to the way we organize ourselves. And, and certainly the way I lead the business, we're a small business of 20, 27 people now, mostly engineers. It's more about the, you know, as Brian said, the culture, how you lead the organization, how you communicate with people through a, a great period of uncertainty, not just for your own team, but for also their families, uh, their loved ones. Everyone's looking to to my company uh, for some answers as to what, what's going to happen, what's going to happen to us, what's going to happen to our livelihoods, can we pay the mortgages, what is the company going to survive, all those usual questions that are happening that are, are being asked of every single company, and particularly startups. Um, but, but in actual fact, we're a drone delivery as a service business. And when you think about our you know, landscape as an opportunity for the next five to 10 years, you look at the whole space that we're in and it's Jetson kind of stuff. It's very futuristic. In most people's minds, it really is you know, some crazy concept of using a drone to deliver your pharmaceuticals, your prescribed medications, or your, it could be your, your dinner, and you know, all these things. And for people to get their heads around that, it's always going to be a long haul of educating generally consumers, businesses, investors even, around the potential of what we're trying to achieve. And, but what's happened with the, with the pandemic and the forced thinking, not just in in individuals and companies, but in governments and regulators uh, and pretty much all tiers of commerce and society have been forced to think about what the future will look like for, for the whole world, the future of people staying at home, the future of distributed working, uh, the future of contact free, no more shaking hands, all of these big, big things that, that you know, have surfaced as questions of, you know, when people look to the future. And then you, you look at what we do, which is a, a human-free, contactless, efficient, scalable system for the future. And what's happened to us is everyone's looking at what we do and saying, you know what, that's actually better than the old way. I don't want uh, some stranger that's in a car that's carrying my food or my prescription medicine to my house and knocking on my door. I want that delivered through the air uh, by drone, you know, human-free. So... 
it's actually the, this crazy world that we live in now has presented a really great, I won't say call it an opportunity because that's crass. What I'd say is it's completely changed thinking around the stretch technology target that we represent and in a good way. So we see investors looking at us differently. We see big brands looking at us differently. We see inbounds from multiple markets around the world asking us to bring our drone delivery platform there. So it's been, you know, really a good opening up of the opportunity or an acceleration of the opportunity for us. And, and then if you couple that with a, a new structure of communications, a new way to lead a team, um, it, it's been, I have to unfortunately say, it's been very positive for a company that's in the kind of space that I'm in. And look, I think we've seen this in the public markets where tech stocks have led. But I think in the private markets where we have you know, new technologies, it's really been the accelerator. You know, Bobby, you moved from what would have been a very limited trial and a very limited uh, un situation at one, one university yeah. for a couple of weeks to multiple weeks, real deliveries yeah. of medicines in Monaco and Ireland. Yeah. Um, you know, even bigger, John, even, even, even more important, I think, you're right, we've, we've, we've immediate acceleration of 12 to 18 months of our plan straight away. But, but even a bigger indicator for me is that our partner in that business, in a, in a small rural town in Ireland, the partner that we're doing it with is the government health service. So this is a gigantic organization of, you know, two or 300,000 people, the biggest, you know, company in the country, the most bureaucratic, slow-moving dinosaur of a country, of an of a, of a entity, immediately within a week, agreeing to do a project with us to deliver a prescription medicine. It's the first time it's been done in the world. And within a week, we were able to get that organization to be aligned with also a tiny little startup to actually solve a major problem for, for cocooning people in the country. So it's that signal of the willingness of, you know, big, slow-moving things, you know, to, to start to look for solutions to the, what the new world is going to look like. That's where the opportunity is. That's, that's great. Charlie, why don't you touch on what you've been seeing on the farm? Yeah, absolutely. So I think it, uh, I think this, this panel has a very unique cross section of, of uh, people playing in different places. So we are, uh, um, I think a major impact of COVID has been uncertainty around getting food reliably. Uh, we build automation or robots that go into some of the most labor intensive uh, labor-intensive areas of food production, specifically table grape harvesting, uh, and they enable crews working in those fields to space out quite a bit, to produce a lot more fruit, and produce a lot more fruit with a lot less people. Um, so the impact of COVID for us has actually been a lot more demand for the product. Um, you know, I think uh, uh, growers, a typical customer for us will have three to 5,000 people harvesting fruit every day, those people are often in their 50s or 60s, so they're an elderly population even sometime. They're working in close proximity in the field, and they're harvesting something that has to be harvested as kind of the breadbasket of society. So COVID has driven up more demand for us on that side. I think the, on, the, the, uh, challenging, uh, on the challenges side, I think on the people working remotely, we definitely have seen that quite a bit. In robotics, you can't really work remotely. There's a limit to how much you can do it. So technically speaking, we've been able to, um, each of our robots are cloud connected. So we now have things set up where you can log in remotely anywhere on the planet and see the robots running live off of your laptop, which enables people to work more remotely than they otherwise might. Um, so the, the remote challenge in a way has, has forced us to adopt that more quickly. Um, and then I think on the, on the more negative side, for us definitely like supply chains are still really, really challenging. So Demand is up in COVID world, but getting electronics components from kind of second and third tier or smaller suppliers in Asia, especially, that has been a trickier thing for us to do. So we almost have too much demand relative to our ability to scale to meet it. Um, and then finally, I think in the, on the hiring side, what I've been blown away by is just the quality of some of the people that you're finding in part of as a result of COVID 
who are now looking for new opportunities. So I think that some of the, the, the companies that, that, that fare well through this progression will actually have pretty incredible rock star teams coming out of it that are really, really well equipped to scale as the economy starts to rebound as well. Um, so those are probably the notable things from my perspective. So I guess the next question would be, what is the most significant challenge that in terms of your business model right now? So you are trying to cope with this uh, whole pandem pandemic situation. Yeah, I, I would we say it sounds like- maybe there is yeah. too many Process constraints. There may be supply chain interruptions, but except for that, do you have any other issues that you are trying to quickly adopt in terms of these kind of changes? Yeah, we were lucky. We actually have now seventy-six people across. I think we're in eight countries and and in a certain amount of time zones. So we were lucky that that was sort of the normal for us was a distributed workforce. Uh, what flipped for us is we sit in the middle of a two-sided marketplace where we drive demand from online merchants and purchasers and, and work to find and land that with supply. And I think similar to, to, to what Charlie is facing, which is where at some point you can't get away from people and you can't get away from working. I, to produce an item, there is a human contact uh, requirement there. We're seeing now the speed at which we can increase our supply, the deployment of a $600,000 piece of equipment that can increase our supply takes like 12 weeks. I mean, that takes a long time in the best of times. And when demand overnight shoots up by literally 900% overnight, there is this sort of global flight to supply at the exact same time that the human element of that, just through from a safety standpoint, has to be reduced by 25 to 50% to keep people going. Um, ironically, uh, especially in the industry that we're in, the, re the, 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 the economic rebalancing that's happening right now and the flow down and knock on issues that come with that are something that we really have to think about for a longer period of time. An increase in economic stimulus payments due to an increase in unemployment and direct checks uh, to the American people means that it is actually for certain industries of the economy and for us with using typically low wage or minimum wage workers in, in the production of our items, they get paid more if they're unemployed. Uh, that, that's not a political statement, that's just a fact. Uh, on top of that, there's Amazon's absolute explosion means that they've increased pay in a bunch of areas from $13 to $17. We pay on average $15 an employee in a manufacturing center, which means it's actually better for them to become an Amazon delivery person. So it's a really interesting kind of rebalancing that, that has knock on effects kind of throughout where we're at that, you know, you really, we're sitting down now in our executive meetings and thinking, four steps of, of kind of what different situations occur right now. I mean, we're, we're, we're I mean, Ireland is, is an island, so supply chain is a huge issue for us. So uh, we had to do ninja missions on car ferries over to the UK to, to carry parts. And like, I'm personally sitting on a car ferry uh, hiding from the police, carrying batteries over the water to, to keep our flights in the air and then begging political favors to get a letter to allow our team to continue working, maybe lying to authorities to get, you know, continue to be operational. So, you know, you box clever. If you're a small company, you do things like that. And, and for us, it was critical to avoid that two or three months of lockdown where we would be stuck at our desks. And for a business like us, that's operational, that needs to show flights on the clock, needs to, get air you know aircraft in the air and be out there uh, a two or three month lockdown for us would have been absolutely a disaster for our progress so so for us we had to you know do a few clever tricks i suppose to, to get going but once we did um we were we were in a great place as i said and for us the challenges now are i think the, the only thing i don't like about the current situation is not being able to 
get on a plane for hiring or for raising capital, for warming up investors and presenting our business, you know, getting to know investors, mostly in the US, is impossible. And switching to uh, Zoom to build relationships is, that's absolutely a negative for me because um, it, it works really well for me personally to, to get out there on planes, meet people, spend time with them and, and build trust and relationships people so so that's been probably the biggest negative for me but at the same time you could say that's a positive because I'm much more productive working with the team and not having to travel so you know on one hand you lose on the other hand you win I think I think one of the things that's really interesting here to me is what we've heard from each of these companies is supply chain issues and, w- and what I talked about at the front is zoom doesn't Nest doesn't only have a finite number of sessions they can sell. They can sell a very large number. They just have to buy back-end infrastructure, but that's been built to be scalable. When you're, you know, printing physical goods, there's supply um, uh, constraints. When you need parts for a borrow or for a man or drone, there's supply constraints. And what I think, I think the big macro takeaway for me, I don't know how to invest against it yet. I suspect that over the next three years to five years, we're going to build supply chains within the U.S. And it doesn't apply so much to Bobby because he's in Ireland, but I think that we're going to build our own semiconductor chip factories here. We're going to build um, supply components into there. We're going to have local inventory, um, and I think we're going to build more robustness uh, to support businesses like these. And I think if I was an entrepreneur today, I'd be looking to see how I could be part of that. I think there'll be government uh, subsidies and money in the U.S. to do this. And I don't think, I think the U.S. will not be alone in doing this. I think there'll be manufacturing also um, growing as a base in Europe as well. And I think what we've seen is the global supply chains are conflicted through you know, national and other priorities um, that we would want to actually um, uh, participate in. If that makes sense. Yeah, I think Bobby has brought up one very interesting question. So that is actually, I want to ask towards John. So as an investor right now, when you're talking with all the entrepreneur that you have to use Zoom, do you feel like that doesn't give you that kind of connection or do you feel this is a downside for you to overview the uh, potential prospect invest opportunities? Yeah, but for, for me, it's a, it's a downside because, I mean, you build business on often, you know, internally when you're building R&D and you're building product and you're innovating, but you still build, ultimately build it with customers and partners, strategic partners. And you do that with, you know, on, on the basis of trust, friendships, loyalty, you know, relationships. And luckily for us, we're a startup, so we're not at the point yet where we need to start engaging with large enterprise customers you know, and, and, and too many investors anyway. So it will be a huge problem for us if we were at a later stage, for sure. But for now, we can, we can manage it. Okay. So it's been, a, a, it's been a really interesting kind of aspect to this. And I think the numbers, this is where the numbers don't really tell the whole story. If, if you look at, I think there was a report that came out, John, you'll probably know yesterday around the investment activity that actually occurred from March or, or April, May, and June, or within the last three months, is significantly higher than you probably expect. Um, but, but I think that kind of belies the idea that investing and that relationship building started much earlier than three months ago. It's very, very rare that an investor will meet a founder for the first time and have an investment in within the next three months. Uh, I should know I have that major problem in trying to keep relationships. Um, but, but I'm interested to see over the next three to six months, as you don't have that sort of 
introduction and, and warm introduction and the ability to sit down and break bread and, and, and have a conversation and really get to know someone on a more personal level that has been a cornerstone of, uh, of especially private and venture capital investing. I'm interested to see whether or not investors can make that change. Investors are very, very used to it. I, we, I've been on a few different webinars with some of the most just absolute cringe suggestions on like, how can investors get to know a startup better? Like, let's play online backgammon. Like, oh my God, that sounds horrible. Like, um, but they, they're gonna have to find some way to be able to get it done in an industry where no matter what level of diligence you do, you're so far away from, you know, you're investing over a seven to 10 year period this is this is an industry that is as much feel as it is sort of you know quantitative. Point and as Bobby was saying that you know things are going to change for the new normal that you won't be able to shake hands or meet people. And as an investor, when a new entrepreneur comes for investment, there are many things like you look at the body language for both parties. You look at the body language and you look at how they're doing things or small cues on everyone's reaction to actually make a deal and make build a relationship. So how, how would you go on from now, like John, for John or for the CEOs, how would you go on building that relationship now on Zoom or anything? Or investing in new firms, as Brian was saying, that it would be difficult, but now building a new relationship. Um. It's kind of interesting. We, we have three companies we're looking to invest in now. Um, uh, one of them we've known and met the founders over a period of time. One of them's quite new. And I think you just do your best. You rely a lot on diligence. Um, but I think um, it, it's, you know, investing is a very interesting business. Um, and you know, it's, you can't reduce it to a checklist. It comes down to a gut feel and a lot of the gut feel is knowing the person and absolutely meeting them in person really helps. Um, and I think that it's meeting them in person is, is sufficient, but I don't know if it's necessary. I think we could probably make an investment in someone we haven't met before if we were able to tick other boxes. I'm not sure I could tell you what they are. All right. You know, sometimes uh, you meet someone like Bobby, you know, you know, sketchy kind of guy. Just, and it takes you months charisma. before you want to give him money. Just oozing <laughs> personality. That's how I sell stuff. I try to steer them away from the facts. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, did actually, I did actually get some investors that I didn't meet as part of a recent round we raised. And... It did work, but it wouldn't work for later stage, larger checks. I just couldn't see that working. I'd be interested in, in, a, in how that's going to pan out, actually. Bobby, do you typically turn your video off when you're meeting with investors? Is that your trick or what? <laughs> yeah, I send them a, a portfolio of pictures beforehand so that they can enjoy me from different profiles. And uh, for the CEOs, how much has your overall routine changed with, you know, with your involvement with the VC? How much has the, have the meetings become more frequent, more often? And how are you interact, interfacing to solve business challenges? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I think a lot of people are feeling this, but the, the feeling that you don't turn off is definitely there. I mean, one big issue that we've seen just from a growth standpoint is if we can't grow our team as fast as our business has grown. A lot of times that's going to be a really kind of positive, but we've just recently started to shift back to a five ish day work week from six and a half company wide for a month and a half. And in mid May, we moved down to a six day work week because we just didn't have enough people. Um, We've had, John, probably two or three ad hoc board meetings with check-ins. I think, I think one of the things that, that at least we've had with our investors is a fairly open kind of series. And so there's much more check-ins around what's going on. Um, but I, I think the, one of the biggest benefits that we've had is um, the connection within a venture capital portfolio where there's a sense of, you know, it's 
of being teammates, if you will, uh, you know, and, and kind of saying it's, it's there. We have a recruiter right now that's effectively on loan because they were furloughed from one of our venture capital portfolio companies for three and a half months. So she joined us two months ago and she's going back to that company uh, in a month. Uh, Bobby and I have been on multiple calls between, um, between the PPP program and, and company culture and kind of just those best practices where, frankly, from my seat as the CEO, and Bobby spoke to this earlier, everyone in your company is looking at you to say that you have the answer when you, when in a lot of cases, you're just as sort of in the dark as everybody else. Um, yeah, that's a big one for me. That, that whole thing about, you know, I was, the, the whole word, the whole leadership word is really important to me. And this is the time when you really need to stand up and, and lead the people through. And even though you may be just as uncertain as they are, um, and just on the point of, you know, investors and and the current environment and how they are feeling. You know, a lot a lot of a lot of investors are also struggling or managing with with tough situations in their portfolios. And you know, I, I think that drives a lot of sensitivities and a lot of probably those extra check ins or or extra questions. And you know, as founders, we need to be aware that, uh, that that's the case and that's going on. So there's a lot of turbulence all around not just on the on the the operator side but on the investor side too so conscious of that so another really interesting question that a lot of us have are how are you guys dealing with the technology basically accelerating 10 years into the future how are you guys taking on that challenge of technology literally iterating both in a societal way technologically um, how do you think the response has been um, and how are you responding internally within your companies to these huge leaps of innovation? Ten, ten years is a long time. <laughs> I mean, let's go back ten years, 2010. I'm not sure the world we live in today. Um, uh, you know, if you follow Elon Musk's view of 10 years, we'll have autonomous vehicles, we'll be, you know, riding in, you know, bored tunnels under cities, um, in our cars, uh, we'll be, or we will have established a colony on Mars and shipping tens of thousands of people. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll all be solar. I mean, a lot of those things, I think we're going to move in those general directions, but there'll be lots of things we, can't predict that will happen. Um, but, but I think each of these companies in their own way are riding very strong secular waves that play into changes in human behavior that today don't seem normal and will be natural. It will be natural to have autonomous vehicles on farms, farmers and farm workers. It will be natural that last mile delivery will be delivered by drone and not by people. The, you know, given the demand that people want things today when they order online, whatever it is, there aren't enough cars, there aren't enough roads, uh, there aren't enough people to just you know, drive it over to you. you know, the environmental, in environmental impact is too high. And likewise, you know, on e-commerce, e-commerce penetration, even though the term feels old, is still relatively low. And the notion of on-demand e-commerce, that you, you go to a concert and you want, by the time you get home, to have something printed related to that, rather than you have to carry it, and it just turns up dropped by a drone, means that, you know, Brian and uh, Bobby are probably going to have to work together at some point. But, you know, but seriously, e-commerce going online and the on-demand side of it is still in the early stages. These things will take a long time to play through. And um, each of the visions these companies have are incredibly big and they can play out over five or 10 years. But the focus is, what are we doing in one year, two years, and the next three months? How do we make sure that the next quarter works so that we have the opportunity to be there for the quarters behind? 
Yeah, so I, I, have, I have two thoughts on this. Um, one, I think, I think that everybody on the – certainly John, Bobby, Brian, and myself, we are not in the business of predicting 10 years out. We're really in the, in the business of predicting one through five, and the vision is more of the 10 or 20. Um, so so, so that the first point. The second point, on the technical side, I think as we've talked about things like Zoom – and that sort of, uh, uh, you know, the, the ability to, to jump on remotely and do kind of white collar level correspondence and work in an office setting, that doesn't exist for a lot of people doing manual labor. And so uh, my impression is that as, as a result of COVID, what you will definitely see accelerating is a lot of autonomy in domains where you can get it working in years one through five. And it builds towards a world where people aren't actually where, where people are actually able to do something more akin to Zoom, but in some of these other sectors where you're physically working with your hands are actually out in settings today. Um, but again, the, making those predictions on what 10 years or 20 years out look like, I don't, I don't think we're quite in that business. For the most part, we're in the business of what do years one through five look like and how do you make that real with an eye towards a vision of the next 20? I, I, I think you know, uh, two years or three years is the, is the new 10 years. I think that populations are, are getting more and more used to big seismic advances in technology. You know, we had the internet, we had the mobile phone, we have, you know, cars, self-driving cars coming up soon. You know, you have a bunch of generations now, the last two or three, that have been programmed to expect big changes to come soon. So the adoption curve, I think, is much more compressed or has been for the last 10 years or more. And along with that, the pandemic, you know, really rams that home. And I think that's what's different here. So I definitely wouldn't think, and I don't think you need to think in 10 years, even before the pandemic, something as, as far out there as drone delivery, you know, or you know, certainly drone delivery, believe it or not, drone delivery was less known or less considered or certainly less supported by the general population than autonomous driving, which is still another 10 years away. And actually, drone delivery is running now in Ireland, you know, all, all day long, every day. And so, so there's, but there is this thing about, you don't need to think in 10 years. You can really think you can introduce a, a completely disruptive, pervasive, and universal change to people's lives through technology that could be adopted in less than five years. I'd argue, Bobby, it also needs to be adopted in less than five years. I think as much as investors say that they have a seven to 10 year kind of vision and window here, the kind of cycle for success has actually compressed as well. And I think with that idea of planning three years out, we're seeing the expectations, especially through this because of the compression of really people's lives and, and almost that real focus on the narrowness of what we're doing now, we're having to compress our release cycle even that much more to show incremental progress in ways that we hadn't before. Thank you guys for that insight. It's really easy to think that 10 years today is 10 years tomorrow. But as you all said, technology just iterates so fast that sometimes the window of time now is not going to be even a fraction of the window maybe a year or two. So our last question is really for every market drop, there is a slew of new innovation and in startups. In this particular market drop, there has been a mass exodus of small businesses and startups, and it's a very unpredictable time. So do you guys predict that the companies that do survive now will go on to have a longer life cycle or grow to be much larger than expected and bypass an exit? Are we entering an age of businesses that are too big to fail, or will we still have small businesses? We will have small businesses. There always will be small businesses. Um, however, the large tech companies do dominate. And I think the latest secular cycle of AI has strengthened them. And because we've been through um, because of what we've been through over the last few months has been an accelerant, it's accelerated their businesses as well. Uh, Amazon, I believe, hired 250, 350,000 people over the last few months, and they intend to keep them. But likewise, Walmart did as well. 
Now, is there a too big to fail aspect here? Um, I'm not sure too big to fail, but these companies are very dominant in their industries and it is up to government to decide um, how they want large corporations to work. That's why we have antitrust laws and governments will work that out. With regard to smaller businesses, there are still opportunities. You know, each of these companies that we're talking to here have been found in the last few years. We have 76 companies and um, many of them uh, have benefited from this situation. Some have not. Um, uh, and, but um, I think generally this has been accelerated for these businesses. In addition, a lot of incredibly talented people have been let go. And you've had massive changes in, humans, in human behavior. Those two things usually throw up new businesses in areas that people just haven't considered before. And I'm not a believer that everything that can be invented has been invented. I'm not a believer that innovation is dead. And so I think there'll be new businesses that come out that we can't yet really think about that will become very large and very interesting over the next few years. Um, certainly including these ones, but new ones as well. So no, I don't think innovation is dead. Times of disruption create new great companies. Um, and you know, remember what I said right at the beginning here, I think this is an economy, a strong economy that was interrupted and a strong stock market was interrupted. Um, the trillions of dollars that have been pumped in by the government and by the Fed have certainly helped manage the scale of the disruption. Um, Brian mentioned PPP earlier, which is a program getting money directly into the hands of small businesses so they can manage payrolls better. That's one of the programs that um, I think has worked actually pretty well. Um, no, I think, it's, I think we we're coming into a renaissance period of uh, really interesting companies going to be created. But yes, some companies are very large. Governments will uh, work out how they want to deal with that. Okay, so for the last question, we're actually going to open it up to the audience. Do any of our audience members have any questions? Um, if you guys have any questions, just please put it in the chat box and we'll be more than happy to ask our wonderful guests. Hi, everyone. Um, so thank you all for coming today. Uh, I do have a question on the uh, cybersecurity industry. So uh, with the COVID-19 uh, going on, uh, more and more people are adopting the work from home trend and also the increased use of the telemedicine and digital payment. Even we're talking about drone technology. Um, so do you guys uh, think this will have a substantial uh, growth push for this industry? Uh, so this, that's my uh, first part of the question. And the second part is with the de deployment of the 5G technology. You know, it's being marketed, marketed as a more mature and more secure network. But um, do you think um, deployment of 5G will have a positive or a negative impact on the cybersecurity industry? Uh, I'll answer the 5G question, if you don't mind. It's a good question, Nick, because everyone talks about 5G as a driver in the drone industry. Certainly all the 5G companies do, or the network operators. So the theory, you know, being, being pushed out there is the 5G with the, with the reduced latency and increased bandwidth is what drones need, and you know, drone delivery networks, autonomous cars, all these things need. And, and actually, they, they don't, you know, for, for me, or certainly... The industry I operate in, um, there's, there's really zero use for 5G. It's a, it's a really strange thing to have to say, but we're in aviation in the end. The drone is an aircraft, and and all of your systems have to have redundancy to, you know, you know, so many nines that that 5G networks will never provide if they're run by commercial operators because it's not practical commercially to to have that degree of reliability. So your aircraft always has to be able to assume that it doesn't have any connectivity. We have to design according to that. 
Will 5G have an impact on other industries, of course, but, but certainly not the aviation industry. I mean, the, the, cybersecurity is an arms race. You protect, you get attacked more, you protect, you get attacked more. There are, you know, as you move everyone to their home, there are more surfaces for attack. There were, so yeah, it's a natural growth driver. It's a natural accelerant. Businesses will have to work out what they want to do and how they want to protect themselves. Uh, so generally, yes, specifically it'll depend on the cybersecurity solution. We've got the 5G. Um, it probably opens up more attack surfaces because uh, more things get connected using 5G. It's low power. Um, so there'll probably be opportunities there as well. Thank you. Any other questions from our wonderful guests? And by the way, this is Nick Wu. He's also the VP of our J board. So yeah, <laughs> one of our lovely team members. Anyone else? Oh, actually, another question for drone deliveries business. Actually, I studied a little bit about drone business three years ago. So, Bobby, do you think there's a market or room for the drone renting business? Because three years ago, I noticed that actually the cost for each drone is so low. So maybe there's um, and the demand for uh, drone delivery is very low. So but now things have changed. Do you think there's a room for the drone renting business. I mean, I think drone is a piece of capital. So as long as the cost of the capital is sufficiently high, there's always going to be a rental or leasing business. Depends on the use case. So do I think there's a market? Yes. Um, does it apply to delivery? Maybe, but I don't think so. But, it, but I wouldn't completely rule it out. It'd be more the high end drones for, for other purposes. I think it'd be valid to have a rental model. Um, I have a question for Charlie, if I may. Um, Charlie, I am going to apologize in advance. It's, it's uh, not an accurate question or a stupid question, but um, how do you, how would you uh, test your robots, for instance, in a new farm, or how how can you do that with you know with among in, within the COVID era, era? Like, how can you? send a robot to a new piece of a farm to test and see if it works and if it's gathering the proper data and if it's functioning properly. Yeah, um, so I, I guess we're getting into the, the dirtiness of COVID. So we're in food production. Uh, you're fully exempt. You get on planes and you fly out and you get in the field. You take all proper precaution, but that, that doesn't stop. Um, and then we deal with, the growers we deal with are taking the, the situation I think pretty seriously, people will be, you know, in, in masks in the field, they will be, uh, you know, using, using hand sanitizer and so forth. But in a business where you need people to produce food, that must go on. Um, and then we as a robotic supplier, um, we, we try to segment our team. So our team members are never traveling with each other. And uh, we have a lot of people that are on the ground specifically in California close to the growers, so they're not like getting on planes a lot, but there still is an element of going to a grower with the six or, you know, the six robots that, they, that most growers are running right now and working alongside them to some extent to make sure things are working perfectly. Um, at, at least on the hardware side, on the autonomy side, that's very remote for us now. I see, thank you. Any last questions, anybody? Okay. Oh, wait, we do have one question from Wayne Chan. Um, so with the pandemic going on, how do you hire and onboard employees when you may have not met them before? How do you bring organization culture into play? I think um, Brian Rainey touched on that a little bit prior. Yeah, we, we have hired since April, I think we're at 19 or 20 people that have joined our company since April and obviously have not met in person any of those people. Um, it is a forcing agent to really check your onboarding. We're a distributed company as it is and we really didn't have a great onboarding program. 
Uh, it highlights how bad I am at, at our welcome. I'm, I, I say hello to everybody on the first day and it's a complete disaster. So I now have another teammate that's always on the call with me to pick up where I let, uh, let go. Um, there's a lot, lot, lot more that we do now around written communication and the hiring process. Written communication, no matter how many Zoom calls we get on Slack and email, and uh, some sort of workflow management system we use, JIRA and Confluence, is the primary means to sort of asyncratic work. And so we do much more around writing within the interview and vetting process than we do, than we, than we did before this. And we put a lot more requirements on, as you're coming into the company, what the hiring manager is required to have. We're really, really detailed and specific on the first 30 days of what you have to do at the same time we just rolled out today a who's who of people in the company where we normally allow our global all hands meeting to allow people to kind of get together on that so it's very very difficult it's becoming more reliant on the individual team or department to really build that culture up uh, because that's who you're working with on a day-to-day -day basis but little things really really matter uh, we use non-work related channels on Slack much more, book clubs and music and hiking and outdoors. We use our general channel much more broadly where we were really, really sparing and limited on that. Actually, um, as much as it pains me to compliment Bobby, I took a great uh, tip from him a couple of months ago, which was sending out my thoughts over our general channel in Slack every week to two weeks or even twice a week where it's necessary means that's a single message that everybody's getting behind, which doesn't have to be anything more than here's what I'm thinking about today, which connects what our partner support agents are doing in Serbia to our engineers in, in, in Alberta, Canada. It connects everybody around sort of a single item. Um, we've also shifted yeah, like bi-weekly all hands meetings. You know, it's, it's, it's tough, but it's, it's a shared experience. I think that's the biggest piece. Yeah, I think it's a great tool. Like that, 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 you know, weekly email I send that is a great tool for not just communicating the way I want people to think or the things that I think are important or things that I worry about or I want the team to all focus on. They also actually set the tone for, for the team, you know, that they really help me to set a certain kind of it, the tone I would call it, which is part of the culture. And, and I use that a lot. I use it in my last business as well with a much bigger team of 600 people. Now we're less than 30 and I use exactly the same approach and I just feel it's really useful. People value it. I get loads of great feedback on it. And that feedback triggers individual discussions with individual team members that may not, may not have had the courage or, or the wherewithal to, to contact me directly to have a discussion anyway. And the, the email that I send triggers that. So it's really useful. So I, I have uh, two thoughts on that. I feel like in, uh, uh, COVID is extremely isolating, I think, for everybody. And, and as a startup, I think as, you know, as, as an early stage company CEO, you're also inherently somewhat isolated. Um, it, just, it just somewhat goes with the role. You're, you're making decisions that have an impact on people, people's lives in, in many respects. So in that world, uh, at least on our team, we do a ton of communication. We do a, a daily stand with the entire team every single day tons of Slack communication, and then people are working from home quite a bit. And so the, I think the impact of working from home for many people is that because they're working all the time, they're working like crazy, crazy hours because all they're doing is working. And so trying to like force people to not work on Sundays or to take a break has been a pretty big challenge for us. Um, so I think the, the uh, I, I, I feel like this is a struggle that everyone's dealing with. We certainly have a team that have not perfected it. Although the techniques we've been, we've been going with has been a lot of communication regularly about what we're doing, what's going well, what's not going well, um, and trying to keep people to the point where they're taking some breaks to some extent. Yeah, I mean, we have a sim similar aspect and we, we were thrown into remote as well. One of the things we encourage people to do is just take out what we call horizontal time and vertical time. So vertical time is take a day off, take a break, take vacation, find ways to sort of de-stress yourself. And then horizontal time is every day, carve out an hour, 
where you're doing something completely different. Go gardening, do a hobby, do something that's not work. Elsewise, you get to your desk first thing in the morning and you're working all the way through and you get burnt out. So, you know, that's what we've tried to encourage. Um, you know, on the one hand, I really look forward to us having the office and being able to go back and have meetings. On the other hand, you know, our office is in New York. It's in the Empire State Building, which was built in 1929. So the infrastructure is relatively old and they can only retrofit it so far. And, you know, you know as the CEO of our organization, you know, do I really want to put pressure on people to take public transportation in to come into the building, take a shared elevator to come into the office so everyone can breathe over each other? Yeah, and the answer is not yet. Right? And so we've got to find that point. And I think for a lot of people, Q4 is that point. I think after Labor Day, a lot of businesses are really going to try and get back to business and see. Now, it will depend on a lot of data. But if, um, if the US continues to have a decline in number of cases and mortality in particular, from this, um, then I think uh, in Q4 is gonna be the one where big, big businesses really get back to business. And I think small businesses follow. Great points, thank you all so much. So I'm just going to wrap up the conversation. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you to our wonderful guests, um, John Frankel of FF Venture Capital, Brian Greeny of Guten, Bobby Healy of Mana, and Charles Anderson of Burrow. You guys have been beyond amazing guests. We've really learned so much from this conversation. And I feel like many of us are going to leave this conversation with a sense of um, hope and with the sense of understanding of where we are economically, business, as employees, where, where we are headed, um, just as a country and as citizens of this world that are all dealing with COVID and the um, economic downturn of it. So thank you all so much for this wonderful hour and some change of your knowledge. And we look forward to hopefully hosting another event like this again. Thank you very much for having us. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Really enjoyed it.